If you played adventure games in the 90s, chances are you've played Myst. It was one of the first and probably best examples of the genre, successfully followed up by its direct sequel, Riven. Two more games came out under the Myst title, but produced by third-party developers Ubisoft. While those games were in production, Cyan Worlds was hard at work producing a multiplayer version of their best-selling game. After five years and a staggering $12 million, they produced Uru Live, and just prior to the full launch of the online service, produced a single-player prologue called Uru Ages Beyond Mist, intended to introduce players to the online world they would soon be entering. The only problem? The online game was cancelled right before the release of the single player. It was cancelled so late that the game still prompts you to sign up during the installation. With no multiplayer game to hang its hat on, Uru sold poorly, contributing to financial troubles that nearly saw Cyan World shut down completely. This game nearly killed the company that made it and was a critical failure. But really, what's so bad about it? Damning with faint praise, the best thing I can say about Uru is that it's not a bad game. It's not a great game, and it struggles at times to even be a good game. It lives in mediocrity. But in fairness, it was never supposed to be a game on its own. Even then, there are problems right from the opening cinematic. After spending a few minutes with the character creator, customising your ugly as hell avatar into something only slightly less ugly, you're dumped without preamble into the middle of the desert. You don't know where you are, how you got there, or why you're there. Eventually, you'll find out you're in New Mexico, but if you've ever played the previous games, which never mention Earth, you'll have no clue why you're in New Mexico, who the guy with the barbecue is, or why there's a hole in the ground that's clearly someone's home. To cut a long story short, you find a hologram of a woman called Yisha, the daughter of the main character from the previous games, who sends you off on a great quest to find bits of cloth that she's scattered across various worlds. At least that's sort of what you have to infer. She's unnecessarily cryptic about the whole thing. It's as a fine tapestry, complex beyond comprehension, but now torn. We will show you remnants, pieces of the tapestry, pieces of the journey. To that end, she sends you to an island in the sky, where you'll find books that take you to different worlds in the name of fulfilling your quest. And that is about as much motivation as you get for the whole thing. What follows is a treasure hunt slash obstacle course that takes you across five different worlds. Aside from cosmetic differences, each plays out in exactly the same way. Go to age, solve an initial environmental puzzle, travel to the end. As there's no set order to go through these levels, each of them has roughly the same amount of difficulty, though I'll admit that I found one of the puzzles slightly more fiendish than the others, simply because it requires you to do a lot of note-taking that they at least simplify by letting you take in-game screenshots. The journey cloths that Yisha speaks so mysteriously about are little more than save points, checkpointing you throughout a level. When you realise that, and that your journey is little more than a point A to point B run with yet another baffling speech awaiting you at the end, you stop caring about what you're doing. The writing hides what's between the lines. These journeys are to help you travel between. Some of the puzzles are not worthy of the name though. They're only made difficult because of the completely screwed up way the game lets you interact with objects. That is, it doesn't let you interact with them. More than once, puzzles require you to move objects, such as this one, where you have to depress certain pressure plates. It's made teeth grindingly frustrating, however, by the way you move the rocks onto the plate. You can't just push them in a straight line. Often they'll roll out of the way, forcing you to constantly stop, step back and readjust. This puzzle is the worst example by far. Basically, you have to build yourself a little bridge, because you're going to fetch some fireflies from a neighbouring world to light your way in the dark. But the fireflies hate water, and if you put so much as a foot in the water, they'll flee out you suddenly develop the world's worst BO problem. So you nudge this thing into position, and no kidding, it took me several minutes to get this into this rather precarious position. When you finally manage to get yourself sorted, you go away, fetch some fireflies, return, cross the bridge, jump, enter the cave, and they flee. You can only make one jump with them, so you have to go and get more. To do that, you have to build another bridge. So you spend five minutes building another bridge after you've finally managed to kick the parts down from above. Then you go back, get more fireflies, cross both bridges whilst praying, walk them up the ramps, over the stream, into the dark cave, and that's... it! So after you've had Yisha talk your ear off for a few minutes, you get to dissolve a totem pole and have it reappear on your island. Doing this four times somehow causes the space-time continuum to break faster than stale toast, and you do the logical thing anyone would do when faced with a hole in the ground that leads into space.
Jumping from outer space to planet Earth without a parachute isn't generally recommended, but you just walk it off and found yourself back on Earth at the cleft, where, if you reactivate Yisha's hologram, she talks at you again, then provides you with a truly mind screen moment where her hologram somehow becomes real, which I'll admit completely blew my mind the first time it happened, but not entirely in a good way. This sends you to the cleft version 2.0 where you meet the flesh and blood Yisha and are treated to a brief cutscene of an indistinct creature that you apparently saved during your obstacle course. It's something to do with saving one of their souls via the totem poles, it's never very clear, and to be honest won't be made completely clear until list 5, which actually talks about the Barrow mythology and what exactly they have to do with Denis and creating worlds. So that's it. End of the line. Finito. So long and thanks for all the fish. As a standalone game, Uro cheats you on content, but again, it was never intended to be a single game that stood alone. It was meant to be a lead into a multiplayer game. Tantalising little glimpses of the Denise City are dropped throughout the game, but you never actually get to go there for real. Eventually, Cyan released the multiplayer content as a single player free downloadable pack called To Denis, which lets you enter the city and look around. There's only one real puzzle line here, the activation of a bit of Denis technology. It's kind of sad really, the fact that you walk around this big city that was supposed to be bustling with players and yet is completely empty. The first spot you arrive in even gives you a list of names that I'm guessing is the last people who were actually logged in before the multiplayer was shut down. Later they sold the expansion pack, Path of the Shell, which I'm guessing was supposed to be a sprawling questline in the multiplayer. But as Myst fans are fond of saying, the ending has not yet been written. In 2008, Cyan announced that they would be releasing the source code for Uru Live for fans to develop on their own, but whether this comes to anything has yet to be seen. Uru Ages Beyond Mist serves as a glimpse of what might have been, a puzzle-based MMO with head-crushing depth and a loyal fan base. In fact, it's so keen to appeal to its fans that it lacks general appeal. This is a game only Mist fans could love, so it's perhaps not so surprising that it wasn't as popular as the first games. Alas, poor Denis, it seems we hardly knew thee.